Tiru gue Welcome to our video on sugar. Before I go any further, I want to read a scripture from Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 11. He who works his land will have abundant food, but he who chases fantasies lacks judgment. And we'll refer to that word later. In the last video on food that we made called Healthy Food for the Islands, we showed you how refined food has all the nutrients, the minerals and vitamins that are good for your body taken out. Today we want to show you how to make unrefined sugar syrup that is better for you than white sugar because it leaves all the natural goodness in. To help you understand why white sugar is not good for you, we are going to show you a video of the sugar refinery process. And you'll be able to see in that refinery the links that they go to to take all the colour and all the flavour out so that these beautiful white pure sugar crystals have no nutrients in them at all. Next time you reach for the sugar bowl, try to imagine that it was once so rare and expensive, it was called white gold. Producing sugar from the sugar cane first took place in India. About 300 BC, Alexander the Great's army reported seeing a reed that gives honey without bees growing there. This table sugar has many names. Mill white, plantation white, and crystal sugar. But it all comes from the sugar cane. It looks a lot like bamboo, with fully grown stalks that can measure up to 6 meters high. Here in the field, a worker pairs away the husk from a stalk of sugar cane, then chews the cane's raw pulp to extract the stalk's sweet juice. This machine harvests the cane by cutting it at the base. Rotating scrolls feed the cane to the chopper drums inside. As they chop the cane, a fan blows the lighter leaves and tops back onto the field. The heavier lengths of cane drop into the base of a conveyor, which feeds them into the transport bin that follows alongside. Trucks rapidly transport the cut cane to the sugar mill for processing. Once cut, sugar cane begins to lose its sugar content, and damage to the cane during harvesting accelerates this decay. At the mill, trucks empty their load onto a receiving table. It feeds a belt conveyor that takes the cane through two separate washes. The cane must be as clean as possible before extracting the juice. But first, the cane's hard structure is broken down inside this crusher, where rotating hammers break the cane into small pieces. A conveyor loads it into a milling tandem designed to extract the sweet juice from the crushed cane. In this milling tandem, the cane passes through a series of five or more consecutive mills. Large cylinders compress the cane fiber. The juice pours out of the milling tandem and diverts into a channel away from the bagasse the dry pulp that remains after extracting the juice. A worker supervises the operation at each of the mills. A vat collects the juice that flows from the top and bottom of the mills. Now that the juice is extracted from the sugar cane, it's time to process it. However, before turning the juice into sugar crystals, a sample goes through a series of tests at the sugar mill's laboratory. First, a technician adds a thickener that binds to impurities in the juice and then filters it to obtain a clear, clean juice. 
Then, he pours it into a polarimeter, a machine that measures the concentration of sugar. The juice from the mills now falls through this 10-meter high tower as sulfur dioxide vapors rise through it. This process, known as sulfitation, bleaches the juice. Then the juice flows through a device that measures its pH level. While at a separate vat, workers add powdered lime to water, preparing a solution to which they will then add the juice. An agitator mixes the cane juice and lime solution for about six hours to complete a process called alkalization. It regulates the juice's pH level and helps clarify it. In reaction to the lime, the juice's color changes from brown to yellow. Next, the juice goes into these clarifier tanks. It takes over two hours for the juice to settle and for the impurities to fall to the bottom of the tank. A sample taken from the tank shows how the sludge collects at the bottom while the clarified juice collects at the top. Next, we'll see how this clarified juice transforms into flowing crystals of white sugar. Workers filter the residue, known as mud. There's no waste here. The mud will fertilize the cane fields, and the bagasse will be burned as fuel. The clarified juice collected from the clarifier tanks now boils in a series of evaporators. This brings the concentration of the sugar in the juice up from 15% to 60%. Then the juice collects in 15-ton tanks to clarify even more. Any sediment left in the juice floats to the top. A rotating paddle skims this residue off to the sides of the tank. These tanks produce a type of syrup that goes on for still more processing. Workers now pour microscopic sucrose crystals suspended in alcohol into the syrup. This milky solution binds to the sugar present in the syrup and helps draw it out. Next, it all boils in large vacuum pans, forming sugar crystals. As the water in the syrup boils away, workers regularly check to see how the sugar is crystallizing. The goal? To produce a thick crystallized paste known as masquit. It then goes into a high-speed centrifugal machine to remove the sugar crystals from the uncrystallized syrup. Inside, the sugar spins at 1200 revolutions per minute. This action draws the molasses to the outer shell of the machine while the crystals remain in the inner basket. Sprays of water wash the crystals, then the water is drawn out so that only the crystals remain. This centrifuge works much the same way as a washing machine set on the spin cycle. It draws out moisture from the sugar, much like you draw out the wash water from a load of laundry. Next, a conveyor belt carries the sugar crystals out of the centrifuge. This mill produces raw sugar, which has a higher molasses color and is unbleached, and plantation white sugar, which has less molasses and is bleached a brilliant white. The sugar on the conveyor now goes into a large dryer. Hot air blows into this dryer to bring the sugar's humidity level down to 0.02%. That's standard for table sugar. The dried sugar pours out of the dryer into a bag on a scale. It's full when it weighs in at 1,000 kilos.
A hoist then carries the bags to a platform at the far end of the packing facility. At 3,000 kilos, that's a heavy load. It lowers each bag over a chute that leads to the factory's main floor. Workers carefully open each bag in turn and pour out the sugar directly into the chute. It feeds an automated packaging machine which fills a series of two kilo plastic bags, seals them and separates them. This packing facility produces 200,000 bags a day. That means processing 400 tons of white sugar daily. This fine plantation white sugar is available in a variety of convenient packaging options. Unfortunately, these beautiful white pure sugar crystals are killing us. They have no color or flavor, so they can be put in any food to enhance the appeal without you knowing it's there, so that you are eating more sugar than is good for you. Here now is a short video clip from the internet with an urgent warning ending with some good advice. There's been a lot of talk lately about sugar being bad for you. Because sugar is the best, right? I mean, who doesn't like sweetness? You can hate on any other taste and it's totally understandable. Bitterness, sourness, saltiness, umami. Yeah, that's right, umami. Apparently it's a taste. And you know what? Not everyone loves it. But sugar, pretty much everyone likes the sweet, sweet taste of sugar. But now some scientists are saying sugar is toxic. Really, scientists? Couldn't you have just looked the other way on this one? We all know that sugar isn't the healthiest thing. But it's not dangerous, right? Well, it turns out that it totally can be. Here's a sad statistic. For the first time in history, U.S. children are not expected to live longer than their parents. Why? A lot of it has to do with the fact that cases of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease are through the roof. There's another sad statistic. Today, one out of every three U.S. adults is obese. Not overweight. Obese. One in three. But what does this have to do with sugar? Sugar's been around forever, so why is it suddenly making us so sick? What changed? What changed is we dramatically increased the amount of fructose we consume. Fructose is the sweet stuff that's in sugar and high fructose corn syrup, sugar's newer and cheaper twin. Fructose can do damage to your body in ways we are just beginning to understand. What kind of damage? Let's start with the nerdiest part of the body, the brain. Just recently, scientists discovered a hormone called leptin. Leptin's job is to tell your brain that your body's had enough to eat. Guess what gets in the way of that job? Sugar. When you indulge in soft drinks and junk food, your brain has a hard time recognizing leptin, so you stay hungry longer and eat more than you should. This causes problems with your pancreas. Your pancreas produces insulin, which helps regulate your blood sugar. The more sugar you have in your bloodstream, the harder your pancreas has to work. And an overworked pancreas can lead to bad things, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. And when you consider heart disease and liver disease, both of which can be caused by sugar, then yeah, sugar is bad. Okay, cut down on the sweets, right? Not as easy as it sounds. High fructose corn syrup is now added to foods that never had sugar before. Food you wouldn't expect. In fact, a recent study found that 80% of the food items in America now contain added sugar. 80%. But, like a good raincoat, this trend is reversible. Educated consumers can change the way food is manufactured simply by making better choices. Food companies only make what we buy, right? So avoiding food and drinks with added sugar will force the food industry to produce healthier food and stop adding sugar. But we have to start now, because sugar is killing us. Look at these cute little guys, so sweet and delicious. You just want to eat them up, right? 
That's the problem. We consume so much sugar these days that it's killing us. Seriously. You see, sugar is everywhere. It's in all the usual suspects, but you might not realize that it's in a lot of other foods. Did you know that our daily intake averages 95 grams? That might not sound like a lot, but it adds up to 77 pounds of added sugar every year. Now look at the American Heart Association's daily recommendations. It's no wonder one in three adults and one in five kids are obese. It's not just because sugar tastes good, it's, it's also, also addictive. addictive. Consuming it, even thinking about it, causes a euphoric effect that triggers the production of dopamine in your brain, a neurotransmitter that controls pleasure and is responsible for reward-motivated behavior. Studies show sugar is as addictive as alcohol or cocaine, and it's hard to avoid. There are about 600,000 different packaged food items in grocery stores today, and 80% of them contain added sugars. But what we drink could be our biggest problem. Guzzle just one of these beverages, and you've more than filled your daily recommended sugar allowance. It's tricky. Did you know that food manufacturers use more than 30 different names for the most common sugars? So what's the problem? Well, sugars are carbohydrates that are roughly half glucose and half fructose. Consuming glucose makes your pancreas secrete a hormone called insulin, which, among other things, causes your body to store fat. Your liver deals with the fructose, but you can't do it in the quantities that many of us consume today. It releases some of it as fat, but most of that backs up in your liver cells. Now you've got a condition called insulin resistance. You're secreting more and more insulin in response to all the carbs in your diet and even the proteins. The result? You get fatter, and you get fatty buildup in your now inflamed arteries. You're what some doctors call metabolically disturbed. Your body can no longer regulate itself. Eventually, it will kill you. Along the way, your pancreas might give out and you'll become diabetic. And there's reason to believe that metabolic disturbances cause high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, and, of course, obesity. Well, the good news is that there are five simple things you can do to avoid and reverse the damage. Number one, avoid sugary drinks. All that glucose and fructose literally is an assault on your system. Give tea or carbonated water a try, something besides processed sugar water. Why drink all your calories? Number two, read labels carefully. Yeah, processed foods are convenient, but often they're loaded with sugar and provide little nutrition. Number three, exercise a little. It may not seem like much, but a daily half hour walk helps reduce stress and control your blood sugar and cravings. Number four, don't trust processed low fat foods. Guess what? The missing fat is usually replaced by salt and sugar, and your body just converts the added sugar into fat after you eat. And number five, eat more fiber. Try to eat at least 25 to 30 grams of fiber every day. Fiber-rich foods typically are high in vitamins and antioxidants and keep you feeling full longer. Hey, it just comes down to making smarter choices. The foods you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. So, that was a good, clear message that summarized scientific studies which have been made over the last 10 years. One leading researcher is Dr. Robert Lustig. So, in this next video, let him tell us his story and look at the scientific explanation. Fat's going down, the sugar's going up, and we're all getting sick. You use words, you use poison, you mm -hmm. use toxic. Mm -hmm. Certainly I use those words and I mean them. I'm, this is not hyperbole, this is the real deal. Everyone thinks that the bad effects of sugar are because sugar has empty calories. What I'm saying is, no, actually, there are lots of things that do have empty calories that are not necessarily poisons. Poisonous, he says, because of what too much sugar does in our body. So let's take a look at that. Sugar is made up of two molecules, one called glucose, here in blue, the other fructose, in red. When they separate in our gut, the glucose circulates throughout our body, feeding our muscles and our brain. 
but the fructose goes right to our liver, and it's in the liver where all kinds of problems begin. When you metabolize fructose in excess, your liver has no choice but to turn that energy into liver fat, and that liver fat then causes all of the downstream metabolic diseases. We'll tell you more about those diseases in a moment. But first, let's talk about your brain. Too much fructose, says Lustig, shuts down the part of your brain that tells you when you're full. It doesn't get registered by the brain as you're having eaten. So if you take a kid and prep him with a soft drink and then let him loose at the fast food restaurant, does he eat less or does he eat more? Turns out he eats more. Jonathan's blood work suggests he may be on the verge of getting one. Dr. Dan Flanders. His results suggest that he's pre-diabetic, that his levels have been high, and that if we don't make some changes to his lifestyle soon, uh, diabetes is coming. Today in North America, it's estimated more than 100 million people are diabetic or pre-diabetic. Dr. Robert Lustig is quite sure he knows why. So I can actually categorically say to you that sugar is the proximate cause of diabetes worldwide. And we have hard and fast data to show that. His data come from his own study done over a decade, comparing diabetes rates in 175 countries with people's diets. And we ask the question, when you adjust for all of the factors that we know are relevant, what about the food supply predicts diabetes rates worldwide? Answer, sugar, and only sugar. In this lab, students are the guinea pigs. The scientists are feeding them sugar to figure out if it raises the markers for heart disease. That drink contained 25% of her daily calories as high fructose corn syrup. Every time they've run the test, says Dr. Kimber Stanhope, the results have been the same. We saw increases in visceral adiposity. That What's means that? that's the fat within the abdominal region. This is the fat surrounding the liver and the intestines and the kidney. This is the fat that is associated with increased risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The Breedens know that fat. Anna and Jonathan have already been diagnosed as having fatty livers, which puts them at risk for raised insulin and triglyceride levels. That's the fat in our blood. When Dr. Stanhope tested the blood of her college guinea pigs, healthy kids with healthy livers, she was shocked by how quickly they saw problems. We definitely, in two weeks, see increases in the risk factors for cardiovascular disease in the blood. Just in two weeks? In two weeks. Stanhope can't speak to the other studies, but she says she tested for all kinds of things and it was only the fructose that caused the problems. If I had results as strong with regard to a food additive, a brand new food additive, and then I started producing these results, they would, that additive would get pulled pretty quickly. That's how strong these results are? I think are? they are. Let me ask then, do you believe that sugar consumption causes cancer? I think, yes, I think that uh, eating too much sugar can definitely increase the probability of cancer and also make the outcome of people who already have cancer uh, out worse. So how? Well, let's review what sugar's made of. One molecule glucose and one fructose. We know that when there's too much fructose in the liver, it sets off a chain reaction. The pancreas produces more insulin. What Cantley now believes is that excess insulin changes cancer tumors, telling them to gobble up the glucose. What we're now learning is that some of the cancers, particularly those cancers that correlate with obesity and diabetes, 
often have insulin receptor on the cancer cell. The tumor, by expressing the insulin receptor, tricks the glucose into going into the tumor rather than the muscle and fat. And as a consequence, the tumor can use that glucose as a fuel to grow. So if sugar can fuel existing tumors and make them grow, can it also cause tumors to form in the first place? The science on that isn't as clear yet, but Cantley's taking no chances. It scares me, yes. I think if definitely, uh, for example, I don't, you know, I, I'll eat fruit. Fruit has sugar in it, obviously. Uh, but if I can avoid any sugar at all in any drinks that I drink or foods, I try to avoid processed foods because it's hard to find one that doesn't have sugar in it. Um, I certainly avoid sugar when I can. Professor Suzanne Delamonte. Insulin resistance, we now know, can occur in any organ. It can occur in the muscles, that's what diabetes is. It can occur in the liver, that causes fatty liver disease. It can occur in the ovaries, that's polycystic ovary disease. And it can occur in the brain, and we think that's Alzheimer's. What makes white sugar so dangerous is that you can be eating it without knowing it and going well over your healthy daily need. Let's look at Lloyd Burnett counting out the teaspoons of sugar hidden in one of the most popular processed foods. Now before we start, it's important to know that 4 grams of sugar equals 1 teaspoon, okay? 4 grams of sugar, 1 teaspoon. So what should we wash it down with? A nice bottle of Coca-Cola. Now. This is a normal sized bottle of Coca-Cola. Anybody can sit down and, and drink this entire bottle without a problem, I'm sure. But let's actually see how much sugar is in this bottle of Coca-Cola. All right, so we're gonna spoon this out. In that bottle of Coca-Cola, we got one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and guess what? This is only about halfway through the bottle. You haven't finished the bottle yet. So let's continue going. We got eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, keep on sipping, you're almost done, and 16. 16 teaspoons of sugar in one bottle of Coca-Cola. How many grams of sugar is that? 65 grams of sugar in this one little bottle of Coca-Cola. Well, Lloyd made a good job of showing us just how much sugar was in a bottle of Coca-Cola. But how is it that they're able to put that many teaspoons of sugar in the bottle and yet it doesn't taste that sweet? So we look at the ingredients on here and we see that it has food acid 338. And when I looked on the internet I see that food acid 338 is phosphoric acid. And the properties of phosphoric acid, it says, are uh, slightly sour and tangy. So it's put in there purposely to trick you so that it doesn't taste as sweet as it really is. Also, they don't put phosphoric acid on the label because if you looked on the internet, you'd see that phosphoric acid is also used to take rust off steel and iron. And it's used by the dentist if he wants to roughen up your teeth in a certain place where he's going to put a filling. A nutritionist that I looked up in Australia advise people not to have drinks with phosphoric acid in at all for that reason. Now here's a change. I'm in Kwaibala on Malata helping Kendall and Fred to get sugar cane juice accepted by the locals. What a difference to Coke! It tastes delicious and it's good for you. For these men it's the first time that they have used a sugar cane crusher and for most of those watching, it will be their first time to taste the juice.
Ang alam mo student. As Elizabeth said, now you don't have to buy sugar, or buy a sweet drink for that matter, because as Kendall demonstrates, the juice is deliciously nutritious in a generous helping. When put in a plastic bottle, the juice has a gentle gold colour and can be turned into molasses, as we will see demonstrated on this farm in eastern Kentucky. In order to make molasses, you need an awful lot of sugar cane, like that in this field on J.P. Campbell's farm in Albany, Kentucky. J.P.'s mother, Hope, gave us numbers for earlier stir-offs. I think they put 100 gallons of juice and made 15 gallons of molasses. You also need an engine and transmission to drive the rollers that squeeze the cane and produce the juice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not sweet. As the juice runs down into the bucket, it runs through a strainer that catches solid pieces. No, that's okay. We'll strain this again through a, through a, uh, probably a pillowcase or something. I was told that the ratio is about 10 to 1, 
juice to molasses. <laughs> so, this is okay. The clay, the, the mud dries out and cracks, and uh, you have to go back over it some. Move your, Here, me. Seal it back up, you know, keep the smoke mm -hmm. coming out on you when it dries out. It takes a hot fire to boil the water out of the juice. A stir-off isn't all business and work. It's also a social event. A tradition in these mountains for centuries. Hours of dipping and scooping and skimming. This day, there was, as is the custom, a feast of sauerkraut, shucky beans, soup beans, onions, tomatoes, cornbread, and peach and cherry cobblers. <laughs> Ready? Yeah, thanks. Turn around on the rim. There you go, sir. The phone turning a beautiful amber gold. Side that young. One, two, three. Keep it level. If it sloshes on one end or the other, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Can you tell how many, any guess about how many gallons? I'd say there's 10 gallons there anyway. Is you? that right? Yeah, don't dirty it up. The finished product. 10 to 12 gallons of beautiful molasses. Now let's watch this farmer so we can see how easy it is to plant sugar cane. As I was saying yesterday, each one of these knots that you see right here is going to make a sugarcane stalk just like this. And this is the old fashioned blue ribbon core of sugarcane. In the old days, this is how corn, this is how sugar cane was planted. Now they have what's called billet machines when they harvest. They don't harvest long stalks anymore. These machines harvest and when it does, it cuts these stalks into little billets about so long. And that's what they haul to the, to the mill now. See what it's got a curve, sir? Yeah, I cut those. 
Got him where he'll play straight. Not on the joint, in the in between. We had the sugar coming out of it. We got the sugar on there. What I'm doing these that are crooked, I'm just straightening them up. Makes it easier for them to plant. And the only reason we cut cutting them is to take the curve out of them and make it make it easier to cover with the dirt. I said at the beginning we'd get back to our scripture and so here it is Proverbs 12 verse 11 He who works his land will have abundant food but he who chases fantasies lacks judgment We've seen just how serious the situation is with all the white sugar hidden in our food and drink and how it is literally killing us But who's going to do something about it? I met this little girl when we were returning home from crushing the sugar cane at Kwaibala. She is sucking on a straw made from white sugar and artificial flavor. She is becoming an addict to white sugar and in early adult years has a high chance of becoming diabetic. Something very serious is happening to the health of the Solomon Island people. Here is white sugar being unloaded from the Baruka at Alki. World Data Atlas tells us that in 2002 the total imports of sugar and sweetness was 7.1 kilograms per person per year. In 2007 it had risen to 10.9 kilograms per person per year. That's an increase of 53.5% in just five years. Look at the steepness of this curve on the graph. However, this is not just a Solomon Island problem, it's a worldwide problem. But to change the world, we have to begin with ourselves. And with God's help, we can do it. But as our verse says, we will have to work our land. Then we can harvest our own sugarcane and feed our children with good things like molasses that is being, at the moment, fed to the racehorses. It's been used for many centuries as a sweetener and was a popular trade good in the 17th and 18th centuries. Blackstrap molasses is actually the byproduct of processing cane chain sugar into table sugar which is released during the third boiling. It's much more bitter than sugar and honey, but also has a variety of health benefits that other sweeteners don't have. Iron Blackstrap molasses naturally contains almost half the recommended daily intake of iron. As you may already know, iron is an important dietary supplement that helps make red blood cells and oxygen circulate through the body. Eating a diet rich in iron makes you feel more energetic and healthy and helps your hair and skin remain healthy. Manganese Blackstrap molasses is also rich in manganese, not to be confused with magnesium, which is essential for general bone health and good blood sugar levels. Manganese also controls important enzymes and enzymes in the body, specifically those responsible for the use of ascorbic acid, choline, vitamin C, and vitamin B1. Calcium If you need more calcium in your diet, then molasses can be an excellent addition. In fact, two tablespoons of molasses comprises over 10% of the daily calcium amount recommended by doctors. As you probably already know, calcium helps make your teeth and bones strong. Potassium Molasses contains a healthy amount of potassium, which makes muscles stronger and helps prevent arthritis and strokes. It's also an important nutrient for overall cell and nerve health as well as an essential electrolyte in your body that he that helps balance blood pressure. 
Magnesium Magnesium is another plentiful nutrient in blackstrap molasses. It's responsible for many important biochemical reactions in the body, and helps regulate muscle and bone health. Copper Blackstrap molasses is also rich in copper, which helps your body make red blood cells and keeps your immune system healthy. We don't need huge amounts of copper in our diet only around 0.9 mg a day but it's an important nutrient for preventing bone weakness and conditions such as osteoporosis. Copper also serves as an antioxidant, helping to control the damage done by free radicals in your body. How to use Blackstrap Molasses Blackstrap Molasses is an important source of vitamins and nutrients, but how easy is it to incorporate into your diet? The answer, answer? Very easy. Many healthcare practitioners simply recommend eating a tablespoon of unsulfured blackstrap molasses with a glass of water each morning. Eating the raw molasses will help the nutrients absorb quickly into your bloodstream. Well, our lady reporter was talking about blackstrap molasses, which as she pointed out is the byproduct of the sugar refinery. The kind of molasses that we saw in Kentucky is the kind that we would be making in the Solomon Islands and that isn't separated from the sugar. The sugar and the molasses are together and yet it's the same product. Molasses either way has all those things that she was describing and I want to show you just how nice it is to have just straight from the bottle. Mmm, really delicious. So I'm hoping you'll try some. Well, we're almost through. So let's make a wrap up with a summary and then a final word. We saw that white sugar is removed from the natural good things like fiber, vitamins, minerals and enzymes in a centrifuge. We learned that white sugar is added to about 80% of what we eat. And this has overloaded our system. It's become like poison and it is killing us. So we must avoid deceptive food and drink. And instead eat vegetables and fruit that have sugar in their natural state. We saw how to plant sugar cane and harvest it and crush it and boil it to a golden thick syrup. We learnt that molasses has many minerals vital for our good health. If we're going to make this change to eating natural food then we'll need to work our land. And uh, we're doing that here in Drury, and it means a lot of work, a lot of hard work. And we also need faith, and you'll need faith too, because we're breaking addictions, and we're going against the habit patterns. We're also going in the opposite direction to the food industry, and even to society around us. But we are the church, and we should be the head and not the tail, we should be setting an example and making a way for others to follow. And last, I want to remind you that our bodies are important to God. We should look after them because they are the temple of His Holy Spirit. I want to finish this video by reading from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. God bless you.